Well, hello again to uh, all my brothers and sisters in Christ who are watching, uh, my friends in Asuyas, British Columbia, close friends, thank you for tuning in. Uh, to my new friends right here in Stettler, Alberta, thank you for tuning in. To family in Alberta and in uh, Arkansas and uh, wherever you are uh, and any others tuning in, welcome to this broadcast, to the study in the book of Acts. This is our fourth study and we'll be talking about living in the age of the Holy Spirit and what that means. Um, very often we call this the church age. What's the difference? Well, there is a big difference and hopefully it'll be made clear as we start to go through this. But before we go any further, uh, let's just bow together for prayer. And uh, this week, I believe I have my mic turned on. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the privilege of sharing your word to so many folks in this uh, listening area and in these troubled times. Father, thank you so much for all your blessings. And we look forward to your help, your strength, your counsel as we go day by day through days that are uh, troubling and even divisive in some ways. Father, we want to lift you up. We want to look to you. We don't want to avoid uh, what we believe is truth for the sake of unity. We don't want to compromise truth at all. Uh, we want to have our unity based on your word. And so, that, Father, that's why we want you to make the word clear uh, as we progress through this study. Thank you for what the, your early uh, children, uh, disciples, did in the book of Acts. Uh, they're with you now in heaven. They were faithful here, living in troubled times as we are. So, Father, help us to learn uh, from their actions. Uh, teach us by your Spirit this day, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, well, without any further delay, we'll, I'll put the notes up on the screen, and I will read and comment, and uh, hopefully you can read along and and I welcome your replies, your questions, your comments. Uh, there will be an email address posted at the end of this video. And uh, I uh, welcome every response and I'll try to uh, address them. Sometimes you will think of something, you will question something that I didn't even think of. And so uh, I'd love to hear from you. All right, let's, let's progress and I will put the notes up on the screen. Hey, there we are, and uh, we begin reading. We're in Acts chapter 2, and if you notice on the screen, it says for verses 1 to 47, so that's a lot of scripture to try and cover in one session. Often I try to divide it into sections, if, uh, if that would seem better, uh, especially if there are various topics. But this is pretty much one topic all the way through, so let's just uh, get started. Uh, when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Holy Spirit, as the Spirit gave them utterance. And by the way, I'm reading from the New King James Version. Very often I use the ESV. Uh, I like the ESV. I like the New King James Version as well. And just happen to be using that one here tonight or today. So as we noted previously, after his resurrection from the dead, Jesus has been appearing to his followers at various times and actually dwelling with them. He, he taught them over a period of 40 days. Now the word Pentecost means 50th. To the Jewish community, this marked a special harvest festival, which was to be held seven weeks plus one day from the previous Passover festival. The fact that 
the event about which we will read happened on this particular holiday is either totally coincidental or God picked it for a very special reason. Well, I don't find any scripture that really leans one way or the other. So I'll just make a couple of comments and move on. Now, Pentecost for the Jews was a harvest festival. When I think of Thanksgiving Day, I think about harvest, pumpkins, squash, and a myriad of other vegetables and fruits that get put on display to remind us to be thankful for God's provision. But when I think of Pentecost for the church, I see a different emphasis. It's the day of the empowering of the church to go out and get the harvest. Jesus said, do not say there are yet four months, or do you not say there are yet four months and then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. John 4, 35. And then Jesus also said, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. So that's what we're all about as a church ever since the day of Pentecost. Uh, we are sent out to go and take in a harvest uh, for him, for the kingdom. So is Pentecost about harvest? Well, in a way, I think so. The church was sent by Jesus to go into all the world and make disciples. And that is harvesting. On this particular day of Pentecost, we'll read about a significant har harvest. Ever since that day, I need to correct a word here, it looks like. Okay. Ever since that day, the church, with the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, has been involved in harvesting souls for Jesus. And here's a statement from Jesus that underscores this. He said, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. A very strong word. Without me you can do nothing. Jesus abides in us via the Holy Spirit, which was given on this particular day of Pentecost. Jesus says that without his indwelling us, we can do nothing. Why is this important to note? Well, simply this. There are many teachers who state that the church will be raptured before the seven-year tribulation period. Now, the basis for this partially comes from a verse of Scripture that states that the Holy Spirit will be removed at that time. And by the word removed, they mean a reversal of Pentecost. Well, this can't be true. Jesus said that apart from the empowerment of the Holy Spirit that we, the church, can do nothing. And yet we read about a multitude of believers existing, preaching, and even dying for Jesus during that seven-year period. So how did they function for Jesus when he said that without the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, we can do nothing? Well, the simple truth is, there is no scripture which clearly teaches a rapture before the seven-year tribulation. Well, then why do so many teach and believe that the rapture does come before the tribulation? Other than a few rather simplistic reasons, such as, well, Jesus loves us, his church, his bride, and would never let us go through something like that. Well, the problem with a statement like this is saying that Jesus does not love the tribulation saints the ones that would come to faith after the rapture, if we're going up before the tribulation, uh, that he doesn't love them because why would he let them go through that? So, so that argument really doesn't hold much water. There's a bigger belief founded on a somewhat stronger basis that's most often used by the supporters of the pre-trib teaching or theory, and that is the use of the phrase removal of the church. Now we're examining the day of Pentecost as it relates to the church. For many Bible teachers, the church was born on Pentecost. They say that the day of Pentecost marks the beginning of the church age. 
By the term church age, it is meant the years between the birth of the church and the rapture. Another term commonly used in place of church age is the word dispensation. It's important that we, that we grasp this. These believers of dispensationalism believe that the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all relate to a previous dispensation. The dispensation of law. Okay, I hope we're following. They say we're in the church age now and the law age ended at Pentecost. And so uh, the only reason that they steadfastly hold to this belief has to do with, according to them, that the church did not exist before Pentecost. It was born at Pentecost according to their teaching, so couldn't have existed before that. So then to whom is Jesus speaking in the Gospels before Pentecost? To a dispensationalist, not to the church, because there was no church. Well, are they correct? We need to decide this one way or another. And if the church did not exist until Pentecost, then possibly the church age could end just before the tribulation, and we would all be raptured up into heaven. And that'd be wonderful. I would love that. That would be great. But if the church did exist before Pentecost, the, the church may indeed be present in the tribulation period. And that might mean taking some spiritual inventory and expecting and anticipating difficult times. Now Jesus wrote some powerful letters to the seven churches of Asia in the book of Revelation. He addresses them one at a time. In each case he clearly stated I have something against you. Unless you repent and, and then he had something to say to that particular church. But he also said to them, to him who overcomes, I will. And then he gave a promise to that particular church. Each one of the seven received a different reprimand and a different promise. So we need to know whether the church was born on the day of Pentecost or not. First of all, the Bible does not use the term born when it comes to describing the origin of the church. Uh, do you find that surprising? Uh, I have been uh, studying God's word for many, many years. I have never, ever come across the teaching that the church was born, the birth of the church. Now, a very prominent uh, prophecy teacher who's now passed away talked about the birth of the church on Pentecost and then he said, as Jesus talked to the disciples in the Gospels before Pentecost, he said the church existed as an embryo. We need to be very careful about our choice of terms. To say the church existed as an embryo is based on the fact that the church was born. But there is no scripture that says it was born. So we really shouldn't be using the word embryo either. So uh, we need to be very careful. Uh, when we when we start to come up with words and terms and try to be as biblical as we can. Okay, so uh, uh, okay, I think uh, let's see. Well, at least this is consistent thinking. I'm reading right about here where the cursor is. Uh, but never has the church, never has the origin of the church been described as a birth in all of Scripture. Let's get right to the root of it. By using a Greek lexicon to get to the actual definition of the word church, we'll discover that it actually is a compound, a two-part word. The word looks like this, and I would pronounce it ecclesia or ecclesia. And as two parts, it's ecclesia. The first part means out, the second part means to call. Like many foreign languages, the order is often reversed from English, so the word ecclesia literally means called out, and uh, pretty much, much all Bible teachers agree that we need to add a word, and it means a called out assembly. So first of all, there's no way that, in the, that the 120 in the upper room became a called-out assembly on the day of Pentecost. 
They were already a group of 120 for the previous 10 days. So let me ask you this. If you were to hear of a group of people that had a preacher who preached the good news, the gospel, required repentance and faith in his sermons, baptized those who responded, how would you describe that group? You might be inclined to say, well, that sounds like a church to me. And that would almost be right. In the Gospels, this describes the ministry of John the Baptist. He was preparing the way for Jesus. He had quite a large following, just waiting for Jesus to come. You know the story. Jesus eventually came to John and requested to be baptized by him. Jesus then went into a wilderness area for 40 days without food and was tested ultimately by Satan himself. And following that, he immediately goes to where John the Baptist and his group happened to be, and he does something very significant. Jesus begins to do what the definition of church really means. He began to call out individuals from John's group to follow him. He called them to follow. Church means, ecclesia means called out assembly. Jesus called them and he said, come and follow me. So he had his own called out assembly. Some of John's followers wondered about that. And they asked John, Rabbi, who, he who was with you beyond the Jordan to whom you have testified, behold, he is, he is baptizing and they're all coming to him. John's answer was, he must increase, but I must decrease. So Jesus called out people from John's group to follow him. These were people who believed in the Messiah, the Christ. They had, been, they had repented of their sins under John's preaching. They had been baptized in water, and now they, were, they are followers of Jesus. That's a church. Jesus had a church right there. Not born on the day of Pentecost, Jesus built his church. He made a statement. He said, on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Jesus built his church. Now the church experienced a time of learning during Jesus' three-year ministry. Then before Pentecost, he gave them a commission to go into all the world. Matthew 28, verse 18. And Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. So there's Jesus giving a commission to a church that was obviously in existence, and this statement of Jesus, this commission of Jesus, was before Pentecost. So who's he talking to? A group of Jewish people and commissioning them? Or is he commissioning his church? Well, you guessed it, yes, he's talking to his church. Now there's another scripture that is more directly a dispensational scripture. This is a very important one. Here it comes from Jesus' own mouth. He said, the law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God has been preached. So if there's any reference to a dispensational divide, uh, a demarcation of a era, here it is in Jesus' own words. He said, one era ended with John the Baptist and a new one started since that time. So there's no mention, there's no verse like this that says a new era started on the day of Pentecost. However, the day of Pentecost is incredibly important. That is the empowering of the church, the church that Jesus founded. So very clearly, Jesus gives us the dispensational divide. The Jewish age of the law was up until John. The gospel age of the kingdom started then. The church age, the church age started then. This means everything that Jesus said about the coming tribulation when he talked in Matthew chapter 24, uh, Luke chapter 18, Luke chapter 21, uh, Mark chapter 13, 
when Jesus talked about tribulation coming, and he talked about it before, the, before Pentecost, he was talking to us, to his church. So this means everything that Jesus said about the coming tribulation was not spoken to the Jews of the law age. These words were given to his church. Now there are many other references that not only teach that the church was founded by Jesus himself during his personal ministry on earth, but also show us the eternal purpose that God had in doing it that way. But I'll leave you with just one more reference. This is from Hebrews chapter 2, verse 12, saying, I will declare my name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. As you can tell, I took that one directly out of the King James. This verse refers to Jesus. Are you familiar with the occasion when Jesus sang in church? He said, in the midst of the church, I will sing praise. So that's talking about Jesus. Now here's the verse. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And that, my friends, is the only reference you'll find in the entire Gospels where Jesus ever sang. And yet the Psalm said, uh, Hebrews 2 verse 12, by the way, is, is quoting a Psalm from the Old Testament saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. So Jesus sang praise to the Father with his disciples in the midst of the church that was a church before Pentecost. A final thought concerning the founding of the church. Jesus gave the disciples instructions about dealing with offenses. He described a three-step process that ends with his saying, in my words, if the person will not respond to step two, then approach the whole church with the problem. And that is uh, Matthew 18, verse 17. So uh, Jesus gave his instructions to the disciples long before Pentecost. He said, uh, if somebody offends you, go to him alone and talk to him. If he listens to you, fine. If not, take one or two others. Go talk to this offending brother again. If he listens to you, wonderful. If he doesn't, take uh, then tell it to the church. <coughs> and we have no indication that the church disciples at that point said, or that, that the disciples said, tell it to the church? What are you talking about? What church? What, 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 uh, to what are you referring? We don't have any record that they ask that question uh, because Jesus is building his church and they are the church and I think they understood that. So I'll move from the founding of the church to the empowering of the church. Uh, that's what the book of Acts, this chapter, is about and we want to get into it real quickly here and, uh, and see what Jesus has to say to us. Well, the church has been given two kinds of power. We've been given power which equals ability, and we've been given power that equals authority. The power we've been given that equals ability, I talked about, I give you the, the, the Greek word, it's dynamis, and the word for the power, the translated power in our Bibles, which means authority, is exousion, two completely different words. They're not even one, one is not a form of the other. They're two separate words. And we've been given both kinds of power. We have been given the ability to go into all the world and break down impossible barriers. He gave us that ability on the day of Pentecost. He gave us the power, the authority, just before that, just before he ascended, when he said, go into all the world. All authority has been given to me. In one verse he said, As my Father has sent me, so send I you. So Jesus was sent by the Father. He had the authority to come here. Then he said, Now I pass that on to you. I send you. We have the authority to go out with the gospel. That authority, by the way, supersedes the authority of the world. It supersedes government's authority. They have authority and we are to submit to every authority of man and ordinance of man. Uh, it, it tells us in Romans chapter 13, we are to obey our government in what way? As visitors. Now let me explain. I might have explained this in an earlier session, but I'll do it again. Uh, when I 
uh, as, a, as a Canadian citizen went to the USA to seminary, I was a visitor. I had to obey every ordinance and law. I couldn't speed. Uh, just because I was a Canadian, I had to obey traffic laws. I couldn't, couldn't rob a bank just because I'm a Canadian. I couldn't say, I'm not under your law. I was under their law as a visitor. And the Bible says we are visitors here. We are pilgrims and strangers. We come from another planet and that's heaven. Uh, well, we haven't been there yet, but that's where our citizenship is. We don't belong here. We are visitors, and as visitors, we need to obey every ordinance of man. But as visitors, we have been sent here as ambassadors from another authority, from heaven. And so we are sent by the authority of Jesus, and that authority is to do a job despite what the governments of the world may say. If they try to stop us, try to shut us down, uh, I'm not saying we need to be ridiculous about uh, whether we're talking about a health law or, or causing problems or endangering others be because of carelessness, I'm not talking about those things. I'm just saying we need to be creative and faithful and not uh, be, uh, uh, not, not fail our Lord Jesus. He sent us to do a job. And we need to do that job. And he has empowered us to do that job. And so we need to go forth in his power, spreading his word in whatever possible way that we can. Well, with reference to the second def definition uh, above, I refer you to this statement of Jesus in John 20, 21. So Jesus said to them again, Peace to you, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he has said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Now this is an interesting little phrase, isn't it? Most often we refer to the day of Pentecost when it comes to receiving the Holy Spirit. But here his little flock was given the Holy Spirit. He breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. What was that? Well, remember Jesus said, uh, well, he said he had to go. And he said, I won't leave you comfortless. I'll send another comforter. And he referred to the sending of the comforter on the day of Pentecost. But it looks like he does even more than that here. He knows he's, they're going to be without anything for 10 days. And so he said, receive the Holy Spirit. What might have happened in this verse 22 is, not, I know it's not the empowering. Uh, I know it's not the uh, uh, all that the, the empowering means, the giving of gifts and abilities, but maybe this is the indwelling. Because he had said in his prayer, he's, uh, or in his talk to the disciples, he said, I have been with you, but he, uh, the Holy Spirit, will be in you. And so uh, maybe prior to this verse, <coughs> a believer did not have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Or perhaps from this point on, they did. Something happened. Something real happened. He breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Okay, so this passage tells about one of the occasions when Jesus appeared to the disciples after he had risen from the dead. Two things stand out here. One is the authority that Jesus claims to have received from the Father and the fact that he sends, authorizes the disciples, the early church, to go into the world on a mission. The second thing that stands out is the giving of the Holy Spirit Notice this is not the empowerment of the church, it is the authorizing of the church. Perhaps this is where the indwelling of the Spirit began. On the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit gave them the ability and the power. But the authorizing, Jesus did that earlier. Well, the harvest is about to begin. The Holy Spirit has just descended upon them. Luke describes it as visible tongues of fire coming down onto them. <clears throat> and then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire and sat 
upon each of them. And whatever happened, and what happens next is absolutely incredible. When the believers spoke, their words came out in a language other than what they no spoke normally. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And the word tongues literally means languages. Many teachers that of our day and time describe this as a time of ecstatic utterance. That is, sounds and syllables never heard by normal mankind, a heavenly language. The context does not bear this out. Any hint at ecstatic is not in Scripture. There is no mention of excitement, even though they would be thoroughly amazed by what was happening. So let's try to imagine the context. There were 120 believers in this room when the Holy Spirit came upon them. The noise level included the sound of a mighty rushing wind, and it included the voices of many people speaking all at once. Can this noise be heard down in the street? Possibly. The disciples leave the building, go out into the street, speaking in foreign languages. Possibly, or a little bit of both. So who heard them? And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. Why? Why were these devout men there, out in the street? Or were they in the temple courts on this particular day? Remember, this day is a Jewish festival. On this day, Jews from all over the known and nearby world traveled to Jerusalem to celebrate. These devout persons were believers in Jehovah as the one true God. So we can't call them Christians because they hadn't heard of Christ. But let me put it this way. They were as Christian as Abraham was. They were God's children as much as Abraham was. But they hadn't heard about Christ. And so there needs to be a transition. These children of God need to hear about Jesus Christ and there needs to be a change in their belief from that point onward. <clears throat> so these persons were persons that lived out their belief and their faith. They, were they believers in Jesus? No. They had not had the opportunity to hear about him. They lived too far away. But God has a harvest day in mind. He picked a day when he knew believers from all over the world would be, in, would be, would be here. God wanted them to make the transition from believing in one God to believing that Jesus Christ, also God, had come and had provided salvation for all. Provided salvation for all past believers from Adam and into the future as well. These believers from the various nations needed to see the fulfillment of what they had been hoping for all these years. So Luke tells us that they were from every nation under heaven. Well, that's quite a statement. We will get to read a list of a number of these nations in an upcoming verse. Luke now tells us in verse 6, And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused, because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Well, I'm picturing this happening on the temple ground somewhere. So what was the confusion? Everyone in the crowd likely understood Greek because it had been the common trade language of the nations for years. The Romans have, come, have become rulers of the world for a, have, uh, have been rulers of the world for a number of years at this point. <coughs> but the official language had not changed to language, Latin. It was still Greek. The crowd, being <coughs> devout and of Jewish religion, would also be able to speak Hebrew. If the 120 from the upper room were speaking in either Hebrew or Greek, there would have been no confusion. The thing that amazed this crowd was that each was hearing these people speak in a language 
corresponding to the part of the world from which they had just traveled. What really amazed them is that they recognized 120 by characteristics commonly seen in people from northern Israel. Because they said in verse 7, Then they were amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these people who speak Galileans? So, Galileans, usually not known for their education or their linguistic abilities, were speaking in the birth languages of this diverse crowd. And how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? So here comes the list of nations describing the crowd. Parthians and Medes and Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya adjoining to Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. <clears throat> Is that every nation under the sun, as Luke said? <laughs> well, I count about 15 language groups here. Luke says, from every nation under heaven. And to me, that would suggest that there were more. Uh, only 15 were mentioned, but it sounds like there were others as well. And what is it, what is it that they were hearing? Well, Luke says they, that the people were saying, we hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. So picture this, 120 believers, they've come down from the upper room, they've gone to the temple courtyards, they've split up, and there's 120 little groups <laughs> forming all over the courtyards, all speaking in their native birth language. Uh, I, I mean, they're, they're speaking in, in Greek, or they're speaking Hebrew, or they're speaking whatever is their normal language, but it's coming out in a language that matches uh, these little, little language groups. So, I shouldn't say little, 120 split up, each speaking God's wonderful words, preaching, and groups forming, hearing something in their home language, gravitating toward that person to hear the, the words that were speaking, and knowing that just over their shoulder behind them is another group, and those people are all saying, wow, and they're hearing it in their birth language. So uh, it was absolutely amazing what was taking place. <clears throat> so it looks like 120, or most of them at least, are walking around evangelizing. They're talking about the wonderful works of God. You know, we need to do far more of that. God is so good, so powerful, so loving, so holy. We know it, and we need to speak it more often. Well, there were 100, here the 120 were empowered to do it. They are sent into all the world, but there would be language barriers. But God just broke the barrier for them, and that's power. Today we send missionaries to language schools. That seems to be the only way that we can break the language barrier these days. I could speak much more on this aspect, but that's really best left for a study of the book of 1 Corinthians. Most of the crowd, the Luke says, were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what ever could this mean? And they're about to find out. But before we move too far ahead, we need to address another portion of the crowd. Verse 13, others, mocking, said, they're full of new wine. Well, what's this comment about? Well, two things stand out. One, they can't understand the words at all. And two, they are mockers. This reveals something about their hearts. They're not part of the devout believer group. They are the locals. They're not sincerely looking for the coming Messiah. They have heard about him, and they were part of the crucifixion crowd. They're hearing syllables that don't make any sense to them. 
To them it is mindless babble. So they accuse them of having had too much wine. So this is interesting. God wants all people to come to faith, and yet he arranged it so that this mocking crowd would not be able to understand a word. Why? Well, there will be more about that in the upcoming verses in Acts. What God seems to be doing here on this day is to create a transition for those who were believers in the only faith regarding God and salvation that had been available, available to them up to that point. And that is God's way to bring them up to date with the fulfillment of Scripture and introduce them to the church. Well, Peter is about to step up and speak to this crowd, I forgot a wrong word here, of mockers, the crowd of unbelievers. <clears throat> and this will be the very first evangelistic crusades. The, result, the results will be tremendous, so stay tuned for the next episode. So we're not going all the way to verse 47 today, but we will cover it next week. So I hope you have followed and you're ready for Peter's sermon and what that's going to do uh, and the harvest that's going to take place when he preaches and, and uh, we, want to, we want to identify with the power that God has given us to spread the gospel as well. So tune in next time and for now let's, let's go to God in prayer and uh, we'll, we'll uh, close this session for today. Heavenly Father, thank you for the word that you've given us. Thank you for the power you've given us and the ability to go into all the world and that you will break down barriers. And Father, if your gifts have changed a little bit in our day and time, uh, that would be interesting for us to know too. Lord, we want to go with your gifts and your power and be able to break down barriers. And so Father, in this time when we are told very often to uh, not hold worship services, what should we do? Lord, teach us. Give us wisdom and help us to share your word in your way and using your method and be faithful to you. And as the Apostle Paul once said, he said, whom should I obey, uh, you or God? And so, Father, when we address man, we have to ask that question. To whom, uh, who do we really obey, God or man? So, Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for each one who listens. Bless each person and give them a wonderful week. And uh, Lord, teach us to use your word and to share our faith as often as we can. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So God bless you. Lord be with you and may his countenance shine upon you and may his power overshadow you and give you victory as you share his word. And God bless you. Bless each of your families. We know that there's tough times and some of us have divisions within our own family groups and in our church groups. And may the God of unity bring us together and may that unity be loving Jesus. And so go with God and we'll see you next time. God bless you.